Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and it's been a little more than a week since our last video. The video computer we used had a meltdown, and uh, I'm sorry that that kind of set back our production schedule a little bit here. Um, however, I'd like to thank you, the, those of you who, are, uh, who donated, we were able to go out and get a, uh, a, get a better computer, and hopefully these productions will be up and running again permanently. Thanks again. Today I wanted to talk about the um, lessons that can be learned worldwide for the operating nuclear reactors that are already um, done and, and, and in use, not under construction. The, the first and most obvious thing is the containment. Uh, containments were made to contain radioactivity. The vents you hear about and how they failed were an add-on. Back in the 70s and 80s when these plants were designed, they weren't designed to have a vent. As a matter of fact, the pressurized water reactors around the world don't have a vent even now. So these containment vents were a band-aid fix to a problem that was identified after they were built. Now, the vents have been tested three times at Fukushima 1, Fukushima 2, and Fukushima 3, and they failed three times. That's a 100% failure rate. Um, that's an indication that this design is seriously flawed and, um, and it can happen here. It can happen in Germany where they also have this type of reactor and, um, and at the other BWR reactors around the world. So first and foremost, the, uh, the vent system that's on every boiling water reactor um, Needs to, be, um, needs to be evaluated to see if it can be made better or it should be eliminated. And if it's eliminated, what should we do about the containment that can't withstand the pressures of an accident? Vents can also cause problems. For instance, uh, here in Vermont, the reactor is designed to be pressurized after an accident to push water into it. Well, if they open the vent and it stays open, they'll lose that pressure and they won't be able to cool the reactor. So we can have a meltdown. That doesn't apply just here. That applies at Dresden, it applies at H.P. Robinson, and other plants. The NRC allowed this to happen. They allowed utilities to take credit for the containment pressure to push the water to the pumps. There's regulations on the book prohibiting that, but the NRC waived those regulations when they increased the power at Dresden and Vermont Yankee, Robinson, and some others. So it's important to remember that um, the vents were designed to prevent a problem, overpressure of the containment, but now they can actually create a problem if when they're open, they don't close. And if you take a look at Fukushima, it's hard to believe that you can guarantee those valves will close after an accident. Well, I've been on the NRC's case about containment leakage for a long time. Um, at Beaver Valley, there was a hole in the side of the containment. Um, I brought that to, to their attention several years ago. The full report's on the website. At um, uh, Fitzpatrick, there was a crack in the side of the containment. I brought that to the NRC's attention last year. And at uh, Millstone, it has the smallest containment for the power output of any of the type of reactor in the world. I brought that to the NRC's attention about two years ago, and they actually said for Millstone that they don't have the capability to analyze containments. It's in the notes. Yet, the NRC still assumes that containments will not leak. They've actually said that in an advisory committee to reactor safeguards meeting back in, um, back in October of last year. So um, we've got a containment that doesn't contain a, a, legislator, a regulator who doesn't have the capability to regulate, and an industry with a series of cracks and holes in containments that continues to believe there's zero probability of a containment leak. Well, moving on, I wanted to talk about seismic criteria. That's earthquake resistance. We now know that Fukushima 1 failed because of the earthquake, not the tsunami. It was leaking and in the middle of a meltdown before the tsunami even hit. 
We also know from another report that's on the website by, by Siemens that Unit 4's fuel pool cracked from the earthquake, not from the tsunami. Well, what that means is that the codes we use to analyze these plants are flawed. They shouldn't crack, they shouldn't break. This wasn't at Fukushima, that big an earthquake. It was out at sea in nine, but by the time it got to Fukushima, they should have been able to ride out that storm, at least the seismic issues of it. But what that says is that what we've been relying on in analyzing these plants may not be working. Two out of the four plants developed cracks from an earthquake and they should have been able to um, uh, just to get through those. At, um, in the U.S. reactors, we've got a, another reactor down at Crystal River in Florida that um, developed a 60-foot long crack in the containment when they cut a hole in it to, <clears throat> to replace the steam generator. Well, what that means is that this was the most analyzed containment in history, and they still never saw that crack coming. Well, they tried to fix it and spent two years on the repair, and as they were ready to run again, they found another crack had grown in a different direction. We clearly don't have the seismic code capability to analyze these massive structures. Crystal River proves it here in the States, and Fukushima pro proves it around the world. A couple other ones that are really obvious are the batteries. There's not enough of them. The the longest uh, lived batteries in an American plant are eight hours, but most are only four. We could not ride out a, uh, a loss of power accident like Fukushima. In fact, it would be worse. The other thing is the tidal surge. Now, Fukushima had a tsunami, and uh, they were designed for a six or seven meter tsunami, around 20 feet, and in fact, the tsunami was 15 meters. At, um, uh, at the California plants, San Onofre, they're designed for a 30-foot tsunami, but yet we know there was a 45-foot tsunami at, in Japan. So we need to take a look at these tidal surges that can, um, that can wipe out, maybe not the diesels, but the pumps that pump the water to the diesels. On the East Coast, you got Florida and the tidal surge from an earthquake, I'm sorry, from a hurricane. And what that means is that um, the hurricane can push an enormous wall of water inland and, for instance, the Turkey Point plants uh, can get inundated by the flood from, the, from that uh, tidal surge. We need to look at these events that right now we've said are impossible in light of what proved to be possible at Fukushima. Well, two more things. The first is emergency planning. In the United States, we analyze for 10 miles out and there's really no basis in science for 10 miles. Um, basically, we didn't know which way the wind was going to blow, so we put a 10-mile circle around the plant, and we said everybody's got to be able to get out of here within a couple hours. But Fukushima showed us that the accident continues for weeks, and it goes in with a meandering plume deep inland. We are not prepared for an evacuation that would be 50 miles away. Fukushima is already contaminated out beyond 50 miles. There's some plants like the uh, Dresden units in Illinois and the um, uh, Indian Point units in New York State that have major cities, Chicago and New York, within that zone. We really need to take a look at siting of nuclear plants and real emergency plans in place of the paper plans we have in place. Well, the last thing is multi-unit sites. And um, Fukushima showed us that if one unit blows up, it can impede your ability to solve a problem on other units. And here we've got, for instance, Palo Verde out in Nevada, Arizona rather, and they have uh, three units on one site and just two weeks ago the NRC gave them a 20-year license extension. Well, how could they possibly have analyzed the results of Fukushima and come to a, um, uh, an adequate analysis of a multi-unit site. Well, that's a technical wrap-up. There's one more political issue, and it's Price-Anderson. Price-Anderson is the insurance pr program that utilities have in place. In the event of an accident, all of the reactors in the country pony up about $100 million apiece, and there's a $10 billion cap on their liability in the event of an accident. Fukushima is going to be around $200 billion. 
If it happens here, what does that mean? That means that you and I as taxpayers shoulder the rest of that. We're on the hook for $190 billion in the event of this. And that's what Price Anderson is. I think in light of Fukushima, we should evaluate whether or not it's right to give, give these reactors um, a free ride on their insurance. Well, that's all for now. Thank you very much.